My glasses are the framework or the lenses through which I understand the Bible. Everybody has this, whether they know it or not. Um, there are people who don't think they have these, and that in and of itself is a framework. Right. You know, so when people say, I just take the Bible as it reads, I'm like, well, that's a, a lens. Being cognizant that you have that is the first step. Because I think people just open the Bible and think, well, this is just what it says. Is it? Is that how communication happens? Is it just thousands of years ago somebody wrote and it directly is relevant for my life today just a one-to-one -one correspondence you know so when i'm reading the bible um you're right there is no plain reading but when we read the bible there needs to be a close reading welcome back to advent next a theological podcast curated for curious faith discussions this week our guest is dr jerome skinner professor of old testament exegesis and theology at andrews university Ever get stuck just wondering how to approach reading scripture? How much should we consider historical context, cultural context? How should we approach passages where God appears to be harsh and unloving? This week, we are exploring the biases we bring to the text and ways we can begin to clean our glasses, reset our frame, in order to have a closer and more accurate reading of scripture. But before we get started, we want to thank the Adventist Learning Community for making this program possible. If you're not already following us on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, be sure to do so at the handle at AdventNext. My co-host today is Michelle Odinma. You can find her at the handle Michelle Odinma Music. And our guest today can be found at the handle at Skins2K2. I'm your host, Kendra Arsenal, and this is Advent Next. So thanks again for being on. Sure. Uh, so happy to have you, Michelle. So glad to have you as well. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing that I begin to appreciate more and more is this concept that there's no such thing as like a plain reading of the text, right? Sometimes we think, oh, I just open my Bible and I'm just reading what it says. Um, but that's that's not necessarily true. So your background is in methodology. So talk a little bit to us about what kind of biases does a person bring to the text and how do we begin to weed through them so that we can see what's actually being said? Sure. Um, the first principle that I would um, bring to my attention when I'm studying the Word of God is my glasses. Mm -hmm. Okay? My glasses are the framework or the lenses through which I understand the Bible. Everybody has this, whether they know it or not. Mm -hmm. Um, there are people who don't think they have these, and that in and of itself is a framework. Right. You know, so when people say, "I just take the Bible as it reads," I'm like, "Well, that's a a lens. Right. You know, that you can just open the Bible and poof, magic." <laughs> um, so when you're you're studying the Bible, being cognizant that you have that mm -hmm. is the first step. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I think people just open the Bible and think, well, this is just what it says. Is it? Is that how communication happens? Is it just thousands of years ago somebody wrote and it directly is relevant for my life today? Just a one-to-one -one correspondence, you know? So when I'm reading the Bible, um, you're right, there is no plain reading. But when we read the Bible, there needs to be a close reading. Mm. And that means that we're paying attention to every little detail, the sights, the sounds, the... Um, environment, you know, um, what is being spoken about? How is it being spoken? Why use this word and not that word? You know, right. um, if I'm talking to you and I tell you something about my um, childhood or growing yeah. up, I can talk at it, about it from two different perspectives. Yeah. I can talk to you as a child growing up or I can do it as an adult looking back. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking about the same event, but my perspective will be completely different. Sure. Right. So when we're reading, it's, it's that ability to recognize we have glasses. Mm. And if I take these off right now, you're blurry <laughs> this close, okay? Right. Um, so it's like that. It's when sometimes people are reading the Bible and they don't know their glasses are blurry mm -hmm. or smudged and they're just reading. Um, so I would say the, the close reading experience is when we're polishing our glasses, when we're trying to get a clear um, perspective. Remember, there's an a experience that Jesus has mm -hmm. where he cleanses a, man, a man's eyes one time. Sure. And he says, what do you see? Like, trees walking right. right yeah yeah and then he did it again and he said now what do you see right okay yeah. so it's it's that experience you know you look at something one time maybe it's not so clear you have life experience you learn how to mm. attend to the bible better yeah um and then you come back and you can see it a little bit more clearly 
Yeah. So what does cleaning your glasses look like? Because even today, like we all come from different experiences. So we talk about something like my experience might be different than your experience and her experience. And so how does someone clean their glasses to be able to see what the Bible is saying? Sure. So there's its principles of interpretation. Um, I like to use the analogy that we should all be in the same neighborhood when we're studying the Bible, yea, even on the same street. Mm. We might be at different addresses because of life experiences, but we shouldn't be in, in two completely different neighborhoods when we're reading the Bible. Um, so there has to be some principles that everyone can say, okay, this is how the Bible tells me how to understand it. And as long as we're abiding by that, you may notice, hey, something um, that I may not like you have a musical um, gifts. So when you're reading the song of songs, you may mm-hmm. see something completely um, new and refreshing that I didn't catch because I don't sure. necessarily live in that world. Um, or you who are a communicator, you might say, oh, look how they're communicating. Mm-hmm. And I would be looking at, oh, look at that accent. <laughs> 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 but we're all looking at the same text. We're all saying it's communicating. Sure. But what we tend to focus on might be a little bit different. Gotcha. Yeah. So In the Old Testament, there's a significant amount of passages that seem that are difficult to understand, difficult to grapple with. How would you recommend someone going about better understanding those difficult passages without twisting it to 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 ill effect? Two two major things. One is keep reading, Mm. because I think when people come to one passage that's problematic, it's like they stop there. They they're not understanding. Well, what happens afterwards? Why would that be something that God needed to do or needed to say? Sure. And if you just stop there and you don't see it in its broader context, then it's easy to just say, "Oh, well, that's antiquated. We don't need that anymore." Yeah. Um. Another principle is understanding this was not written in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that the 21st century is more advanced because in many ways it's not. (laughs) Yeah, That's part of my glasses, my lens and understanding um, the Old Testament. That's a misnomer. Why do we call it that? Paul calls the Old Testament scripture. Sure. So why do we call it Old, Old Testament? Testament? Right. That's a lens. Yeah. And so when people think automatically, Old. well, let me go to the Old Testament. <laughs> okay. This is antiquated. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I want to read a Bible passage to you just to kind of show you what they were thinking um, in their time. Mm-hmm. In Psalm 119, 18, the psalmist says, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things mm. out of your Torah. Torah is the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. That's what I call. And others call the Old Testament. Mm. Um, wondrous things. Think right. about that. We usually don't go to the Old Testament right. thinking we're going to hear wondrous things. It's like, no, thunderbolts yeah. and, you know, the raging deity. Mm. Um, but every time I'm reading this this uh, revelation from God, I see wondrous things Mm. because I'm coming to the text expecting that. If you come to the text and you're expecting that this is an old antiquated, you know, expression of religion, that's what you'll see. I'm not saying that you're not going to see that. You'll see what you're looking for. Mm. Um, So it's, it's called the, um, what do they call it? The prophecy of expectations, something to that effect, that you will find what you're looking for. But I think if you go there saying, let me see something new, let me see something fresh, sure, yeah. that's what you'll see. Yeah. Mm. How important is understanding, and this is something that I've, you know, taking your class in Pentateuch or just finished, and something I really appreciated is understanding the culture and the world to which a text was written. How important is that for us to understand uh, in order to under- better understand what the Bible is saying to us today? Sure. Well, first, they didn't have smartphones. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you communicate in a right. world without smartphones, without right. cars? You know, How do you mm. communicate in a world where when you wake up, chances are your life is going to be out in the field. You're not yeah. going to be, hey, let's text and be on Advent next. You know, that, <laughs> that's not going to be your, your situation. Yeah. So um, when you think about culture, culture is just a way of doing things. That's the meaning of culture, just a way of doing things. And based on where you are, what you have access to, um, how what you have access to affects how you live your life, how you understand life, to that um, effect will you understand what's going on in the Bible. If you understand this is the way they communicate, if you understand this is the work that they do, 
if you understand this is why they practice these types of rituals, or if you understand this is why God told them to live this certain way within their environment, mm -hmm. then the Bible becomes more relevant. You know, that's the word people like to use today. Yeah. Um, but just imagine if someone living in this time reading this book, to them it would be relevant. Why? Mm -hmm. Because they live in that culture. Yeah. So when I'm studying the Bible, I have to do a little detective work. And I have to go back and say, okay, what would someone in that time have understood about what just happened or what God just said? Or what would someone in that time um, think about God? What would they think about their neighbor when they're, you know, experiencing God in their life? So the importance of culture, um, I'll give you an example. When people read uh, Moby Dick today mm -hmm. and they try to reinterpret it, it seems kind of distant from us because it's like well sure is that what he was talking about but if you read it in its historical context it makes sense same thing with Shakespeare right they try to update Shakespeare and if you try to update it it yeah. looks kind of funny because we don't you know live in that world but to people right. who study Shakespeare they try to say okay in the 16th century what was life like what would what would have um, been happening that would help him get his message across where today it's like well we don't think like that we don't live like that those concerns are not germane to our experience so it's not like people are saying well let's just get rid of shakespeare because it's irrelevant sure you know they try to understand what was he grappling with mm -hmm. and so when i come to the text that's um again my glasses what were they grappling with and that's how i try to make sense of it sure so it seems like there's a lot of layers to kind of doing a better job of understanding what God was trying to say through through his word, right? So what would keep the the average reader from I guess being overwhelmed with being concerned about not understanding and when they come to the text they're like, "Well, maybe I maybe I should research the ge geographic locations and I should, you know, do this and do that and what would keep them from being overwhelmed and just starting with the word of God?" Um, sufficient unto the day is our knowledge, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you can only learn so much, yeah. okay? You can only understand so much. And as you g get older and as you grow, um, then it starts to have a little bit more impact because you lived a little life. Mm -hmm. um, in my younger days, <laughs> <laughs> I used to read eight to 10 hours a day. Oh, wow. wow. Look at you. <laughs> and it it burned me out okay. mm -hmm. because I was learning too much too fast, didn't have the life experience yeah. to process yeah. what I was learning, but I wanted to know. I wanted the information. Yeah. And um, after I burnt out a couple of times, I said, you know, maybe I should slow down a little. Yeah. You know, life, life will be okay. Um, so just taking one step at a time, okay. just point by point. You're not going to learn everything in one day. I've been studying this book for almost 20 years now and I just feel like I'm just getting my scratching the surface yeah, yeah my bearings and trying to understand it just a little bit you know mm -hmm. so yeah it's okay <laughs> yeah and we're going to talk hopefully a little bit more in the next episode about like what the ancient Near East looked like sure to have a better picture of what the Pentateuch looked like but you talk about in your dissertation you did it on the Psalms right you talk about three uh, types of being able ways to be able to interpret a text and you talk about exegetically, intertextually, and methodologically. What is all of that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those are big words that make <laughs> academics feel special. <laughs> no, those are just lenses, okay? Just ways of how, do, how am I assessing the text? You know, you pray, you ask God for his guidance, you ask him for wisdom, but then again, what are the tools that God has given us to really help us to um, understand his word. So first, exegetical, mm. <laughs> these words. <laughs> it's just, it's really your, that close reading, okay? Mm. You're paying attention to issues of grammar. You're paying attention to issues of location. You're paying attention to issues of chronology. So you're you're being a detective. You're looking at the minutest details to, tr to try and figure out how is this big picture occurring, mm. okay? So that would be exegesis. Intertextuality is when you look at one text and you say, hey, this seems like it refers back to another text and the words are almost the same. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then now I ask myself, well, if this author is using this author's words, what's the connection? Sure. Okay. So that would be an intertextual um, reading. 
and methodically means that you you have a way of going about it. So I would say principle one, I do this. Then I look at the language. Principle two, I look at the history. Principle three, I look at the theology. So I have a method. I'm not saying every time I sit down and I'm reading the Bible for my devotion, I say, okay, <laughs> <laughs> let's <one>. do, yeah. <laughs> it, it becomes more intuitive, sure. but at some point you really have to start and get your bearings. You have to say, okay, I have to do this to get used to doing it. Mm-hmm. Now when I'm reading the Bible, something may pop out um, to me that, based on my usual methodology and how I think now, I may not have recognized before. Mm -hmm. So I just try to be more cognizant that I'm um, at least paying attention to how the text is communicating. Mm -hmm. What's a text that you have applied those methods to that has kind of changed the way that you see God or, 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 yeah, the way you interpreted that text? Funny you should ask. I'm preaching tomorrow on a a passage, 1 Kings 17. Right. Um, it's the story about the, the widow of Zarephath. Mm-hmm. Um, originally, when I read the narrative, you know, it just seems like, okay, you know, there's this widow, Elijah gives her food, saves her son, let's move on to the Mount Carmel experience. <laughs> right. Yeah. But the more I started reading it, I said, think about it. In a book about kings, in a book about mm-hmm. power, Mm. Who does God talk to? Because he says specifically, Mm. I told this widow to feed you. Mm. Right. So in the ancient or Eastern world, she would be the least powerful. Right. You know, she wouldn't have access. She wouldn't have power. She wouldn't have the ability to do the things that the kings were doing and messing up with. Right. But then you have this lady who has nothing Mm. and she's faithful. Mm. So just things like that, I started paying attention. I'm like, wow, look at, think of, and then the fact that she's a Gentile. Right. You know, in that time and in that era, it was a big problem. So I said, wow, so God, you know, goes away from his chosen people, right. that would be like shock number one. Right. Shock number two, she's a woman. Wait a minute, we're in a book of kings who are men. Right. Yeah. And then she has nothing, nothing that would say, hey, I'm important. Yeah. And then God speaks to her. Wow. Mm. And God saw her. Yeah. Right. And used her as an instrument. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah. yeah. So now when I'm looking at people, um, the practical lesson is make sure that you look at people the same way God does. Because we just pass by people sometimes and just, oh, you're not important, you know. Yeah. I have letters behind my name, but mm-hmm. what did God, the God of the universe do? You know, he looked at this lady and he took care of her. Wow. Yeah. So the Bible testifies that God is love. Like First John 1 John eight says, he that loveth God, uh, or he that loveth not, knoweth not God, for, God, for God is love, right? King James. <laughs> um so how can I come to the scriptures and always find that revelation? How can I always, if I believe that that is true, right, that, that statement that scripture pro- proposes, how can I read and study my Bible and always come to that conclusion? That God is love? Yeah, that God is love. Okay, we've talked about this. First is the definition of love. Okay. Um, I joke, my, my six-year-old comes to me and she says, Daddy, do this for me. And I say, no. And then she says, you don't love me. And I say, wait, what? <laughs> what do you mean I don't love you? It's, in her mind, it's you don't do what I want. Mm-hmm. Therefore, you don't love me. So her understanding of the word love is uh, problematic. So I'm trying to teach her, well, what does love really look like? Yeah. And I think when we're reading the Bible, that has to be the question. Rather than saying every time I read the Bible, I have to come to feeling loved, Mm. I come to the Bible and say, God, teach me what love looks like. Mm. So then when I'm going through my day-to-day life, I say, okay, what would be the loving thing to do? Mm. Well, what does the Bible say is a loving thing to do? And that doesn't mean that everyone is going to like what you do or, or agree with what you're doing. But I think what John was talking about is this experience, this covenantal experience, you know, love God, love man. Well, the Bible tells us what that looks like. So when I go to the text, I'm really saying, okay, let me be a um, fly on the wall, Mm -hmm. if you will, and try to listen in to say, okay, that may not look like love to me today in the 21st century, but in their historical context, that would have been the most loving thing to do. Mm -hmm. So I try to 
So how do you, okay, I'm going to push back on this, right? Because sure. <laughs> we have passages in the Old Testament, and I think people wrestle with this, and I know that I have, an, an, um, after taking your class, a little less so, right? <laughs> but like, you know, passages where God is saying, go and destroy this village or devote this to destruction. Sure. <laughs> um, how do I say this is God being love? Sure. You know, um, and I mentioned this in our class, one of the problems is, is we think society then was like society is now. Mm. And again, that's the issue of your methodology, okay? Um, they were not like that. You know, this is a warfare culture, mm. you know? Um, so it's not like you can move into the neighborhood and bring your neighbor a batch of cookies and <laughs> say, I'm so glad to be here. Chances <laughs> are they would take out their knife and try to slit your throat. Okay, we're, we're just living in a different um, world. Mm. And so part of love in the Hebrew Bible is justice. Yeah. Okay. And I think that, again, if you just think of love in terms of your personal feelings, then where does justice fit in? Mm. But when you're reading about what some of these um, people were doing in terms of their idol worship, child sacrifice, you know, um, ritualized sex or sexualized ritual, however you want to put it, um, they were, were doing terrible things to themselves and to other people. Mm. So what does love look like in public? It looks like justice. Mm. So what would be the most loving thing to do in a context where people are slaughtering their neighbors, you know, in a context where people are putting their children on um, funeral pyres and burning them as an offering to their God? What do you do? Right. Would you just stand there and say... Well, we just need to be loving and do nothing. Right. No, it's it's um, it's hard for us. It's still hard for me today. I'm not going to say it's easy, but it's hard for us to wrap our minds around um, the type of culture that you have. Mm -hmm. That's not come here, kumbaya, let me give you a hug. Right. But I'm going to show you my God is stronger than your God by slaughtering you. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with that? And the more I read, excuse me, the more I read how God dealt with it, I'm starting to conclude that was the most loving thing to do because you're you're stopping the slaughter of a multitude of people. You're stopping people from committing atrocities. Like if you went outside and saw your neighbor killing someone and they're just saying, oh, I'm praising, having a praise and worship session. Right, right, right. <laughs> what would you do? It, it, would, yeah. Yeah. it would disturb you to no end. So I'm, I'm still struggling with it, you know. But I, I have to trust that God knows best and that what he was doing was putting a stop to some of the most atrocious acts that we can't even fathom today. Sure. We live in a, kind of in a privileged world where, you know, police take care of things and we mm -hmm. live in a society of like there's law and order. And so one thing that I think it's important for us to understand, especially like you're talking about looking through, you know, having a methodology, looking at the text, understanding the culture, also understanding, and something that was new to me that I'm learning is how certain passages, like I think is in Judges, they use something like uh, ancient Near Eastern war language, right? So when they say like, I've killed the entire town, doesn't necessarily mean that, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. So again, if you're reading a ancient um book in terms of just being chronologically distant from us, then they're communicating according to the way that the world that they live in communicates, okay? So oftentimes you'll have what's called hyperbole. If you read some of the Psalms, it's like, what? Right. <laughs> no, it's, it's, a, it's a poetic way of communicating when you're trying to draw a picture. Remember, they don't have iPhones. <laughs> they don't have TVs. They don't have Advent Next. They don't have anything like that. So how would you tell someone that God was completely victorious? Right. Would you say, God did it, but no, <laughs> or God kind of did it. No, you would say God did it from one perspective. That would be Joshua. Mm -hmm. But then when you look at Judges, you say, well, let's look at what the people did. So it's, mm -hmm. it's two different perspectives. It's them communicating in the ancient Near East that God was victorious. Mm -hmm. But then there's another way of saying, well the people didn't hold up their end of the bargain. Mm. So instead of looking at it in terms of conflict or a dichotomy, I look at it in terms of this is how ancient people communicated that their God was victorious, mm. okay? I give an example. We looked up the term Amorite. Mm. Oh, yeah. And if you look at it through um, Deuteronomy, it gives you a certain perspective. If you look at it through Joshua, it gives you a certain perspective. And then when you look at it through the rest of the 
Hebrew Bible, you say, wait a minute, but I thought those people were completely destroyed. Mm -hmm. So what do I do when I come to problems like that? You know, again, you have to understand how were they communicating? And that's Mm -hmm. part of our lenses. So I'm not just imposing upon the text to have complete harmony all the time. That's something we desire in our world today. Everything has to line up and measure up completely. Well, that's imposing upon the text something of the way that we think, did they think like that? Can you show me in any text or in any ancient or Eastern literature, that's how they thought. And I know you can't because they didn't think like that. That wouldn't be a a germane concern for them. So when I'm reading the Bible, I say, okay, help me take off my 21st century glasses. Mm -hmm. And then Lord, help me put on glasses that can help me understand how you're communicating in this ancient culture where people would see that you are love. And Just to make it a little bit more clear, when God reveals himself to Moses, Mm -hmm. does he say, I am the God who holds thunderbolts, you know, (laughs) and lightning in my hand, who's going to destroy people? No. What does he say? What does he say about himself? Loving Loving and gracious, gracious, uh, merciful, merciful, long suffering. Yeah. Abundant. So mercy. Yeah. Is God really like that? Mm -hmm. Is he really like that? So when you're reading through. Um, the Bible, the question is, okay, if you're really like that, God, show me how. Mm. Show me how you're like that. Not the way I I think those terms should be understood, but you show me how. Mm. I like that. I think yeah. even in my own personal walk, I can see how God is trying to reshape what I think love is and his treatment towards me. Like, I'm probably more like your daughter who's like, you didn't give me what, you, what I wanted. <laughs> you don't love me, God. Right? right. So how does, I mean, and going along with that, because everyone, and we talked about this, that we have lenses and also we have, well, it's the same thing, but our personal experiences of brokenness, right, impact how we read the text, uh, what passages we, um, you know, are drawn to, et cetera. Um, so how can we be careful to not like almost negatively medicate ourselves <laughs> with uh, a wrong understanding of, of scripture? Sure. Um, I'll use a painful Uh, example for a lot of people, but I think it gets the point across. So if someone has been raped, Mm. okay, and then they read a passage that deals with rape, Mm -hmm. right, and it doesn't seem... No justice there. Right. You may read that and think, well, so they just don't care about people getting raped, Mm. you know. Um, So that's, that would be problematic, you know, because then you're looking at the Bible through your life and thinking, well, Today, if I've been raped, at least there is some type of um, system that can ameliorate, you know, the the process of of dealing with the fact that you've been raped. Well, in their culture, as Kendra mentioned, you don't have a police force. So how do you go about um, doing that? And actually, the the Torah or the Pentateuch or the first five books of Moses Mm -hmm. actually tells us what happens if that happens to someone. I think the hardship is that we don't live in those times, so we don't know every detail about what happened. We only know what the Bible tells us about that event. Mm. So I think the problem is that we're looking at the text, wanting it to maybe address the issue that we have, Mm -hmm. but we're so far removed from what actually happened through the moment-by-moment process that we're not paying attention to the fact that the author may not have been trying to address here is how you psychologically work through the process after you've been raped. You know, the author's um, point may have been, look how bad things are. Right. Right. So I I think if you're looking to the Bible for some type of catharsis, depending on what it is, it may not be there because that may not have been the author's um, intent. But I think, in fact, I know there's enough in the Bible to show us that God does care, right. you know, when people suffer injustice. Um, but just for cathartic sake, I think we have to be mindful that we're not trying to get the Bible to address issues that we may have today. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And I, I like that example because I immediately I thought of the judges and the Levite's wife. And I right. remember... I had to keep reading because the first time I read that, all I'm thinking is like, 
this, this man is an awful person. <laughs> like he sacrifices this woman. But really it's the story of like how the entire tribe of Benjamin got wiped out. Right. You know, so right. it's like they actually went to war and they killed a ton of people over this entire act. Yeah. And so it was kind of like, okay, well, if I keep reading, you see that God was not happy with this event. Right. And there was big repercussions that, that took place. So mm-hmm. right. in your own study through the Psalms, things that you became surprised by, um, things that kind of changed your mind when you started to use this methodology. Sure. One is how often... Um, God's character seems to be the answer to the problems. Mm -hmm. Like you would think God would say, okay, do steps A, B, C, and D. Like live the seven habits of highly effective (laughs) people, right? Yeah. But often when I'm reading through the Psalms, I'm seeing the psalmist says that there's a problem Mm -hmm. and then either he will appeal to God's character Mm -hmm. or God will say something about himself. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for, okay, What do we do? How do we get the political system to work for us when the psalmist is saying, no, look at the character of God? Mm -hmm. Because then only then will you really understand true justice and not just want a quick fix to um, a localized problem. So the more I read, I'm like, wow, um, you would expect God to say, I'm going to do A, B, C, and D. But he doesn't always say that. He just says, "Um, I'm gracious. Mm. I'm merciful. I hate injustice. Because it's trying to give you a frame of thought, okay, about these issues. And then I think that if God just told you to do A, B, C, and D, we would think we'll just do those things and it should solve the problems, sure. right? Sure. Um, mm, that's true. But what we're finding today is um, even that approach to life doesn't just work. doesn't work, yeah. Yeah. okay? Um, what I think it does is it gives you a, a hungering and a thirsting for God to come. Mm. Because you start to realize, well, that's really going to be the only thing that's going to solve everybody's problem of yeah. injustice, everyone's problem of, um, you know, personal feelings of shame and guilt. And, you know, that's the only thing. And that's why the last uh, few verses of the whole Bible says, even so, come oh, Lord Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. Because that. I, I see that as the only way that we can really have any sense of peace, mm-hmm. you know, um, to the extent that you live in a certain uh, socio-demographic uh, system in America, you live a certain life. And you could think, you know, this is the life, and if anyone disturbs this, then that's injustice. Mm-hmm. But what about the people who live in the 1040 window, who mm-hmm. they live a certain life? They may think of injustice completely differently. Sure. Right. So it could be that we're living in a world, I'll speak for myself, mm-hmm. um, I'm living in a world where maybe justice isn't as pressing. So when I'm reading the Bible, I'm not paying attention to that, the necessity for it. Whereas someone who is suffering on a daily basis because they don't have money, they don't have any type of resources, they don't have any type of system that can work for them, they're looking at it completely differently. And when they're reading the Bible, they see the psalmist cry out, you know, Lord, defeat my enemies. And they say, amen, where I may just read that and say, oh, look at that beautiful literary structure. You know, it's just um, the more I read, the more I'm starting to see these are actually real people with real problems. And they're trying to make sense of if you're like this, God, then why is this happening? Mm. And I think one of the issues in um, 21st century America more than anywhere else is that we're not reading it with that experience. Mm -hmm. So to us, it becomes doctrine. Mm. You know, is your doctrine correct about that? Um, But if you really read it as a person who is experiencing these things, you hear something completely different. And that's why part of the um, learning curve for understanding the Bible is that you live life. Mm -hmm. Because eventually, no matter how wealthy you are, um, you're going to experience some type of distress, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, what did what did the rapper say? More money, more problems. <laughs> you know, it'll be it'll be problems. It'll be different. But it's true. Um, I, I think the more I read, the more I'm starting to see. Okay, look at the way the world is. This is what the psalmist was talking about. Yeah. What are some of the questions that that you feel like you get most from students in regard to helping to clarify some misunderstandings with scripture? Um, are there are there any ones that 
that uh, pop out. And also tell us a story because you have tons of stories. So I want you to end with some kind of story as well. <laughs> sure. Probably the question that I get the most is, but didn't God say? <laughs> um, because you'll see something happen and then we don't read about the outcome. Mm. And so students are like, well, but didn't God say this is supposed to happen? Mm. And I say, yes, but remember, if everything were told, what did John say about Jesus's life? It, there wouldn't be yeah. enough the books in the world. Spaces. Right. So I, when I'm reading, I just say, okay, I don't have to have the answers to the questions. You know, yeah. I, the Bible is telling me what it wants me to hear, not what I want it to tell me. Um, so I'm always trying to be mindful of that. And when I don't have answers, I just tell students, I don't know. And it makes them uncomfortable. But I'll read a Bible text <laughs> to you. And Daniel, the, one of the wisest men who ever lived. It's interesting the way his book ends because he says something that comforts me. Right. In Daniel chapter 12, he says, I heard, but I didn't understand. Mm. Then I said, oh, my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? Mm. He said, go your way, Daniel, for the mm. words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Mm. And so it's okay not to know. Sure. Yeah. Um, we live in a world where you say, Siri, <laughs> Tell me this. And it's supposed to give you like yeah. at least 10 responses to your to your question. Yeah. But I think there's something of um, the mystery, you know, the mystery of God where we just can't find everything out. We don't know everything. It, it's supposed to leave you with the feeling of when can we know? Mm. Only when God comes and tells us. A funny story about the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, I once worked at a place called AIM where we get uh, religious questions from programs that people watch. Mm. And a lady watched the program and she said, the, the book of Jeremiah says this and the book of Chronicles says this, and it seems to be contradicting each other. Mm. And then this is when I first started learning about how to study the Bible. So I said, um, ma'am, did you read that statement within light of the whole book? <laughs> and her, her response, <laughs> it caught me off guard. She said, what do you mean? You want me to read the whole book of the Bible? <laughs> and I was like, I don't know what else to tell you. I, I yeah. think mm. for us, it's like, okay, chapters, verses. Mm -hmm. But remember, they didn't have chapters. They didn't have verses. So right. you would have to keep reading. Right. You would have to understand, well, how does this verse fit into the larger narrative? Mm. And it, it always reminds me, um, people will find what they're looking for. Right. But to the person who is... I'm taking it step by step, point by point, applying what the Bible teaches us about how to read it, we'll start seeing maybe it's not um, a dichotomy or a contradiction. Maybe it's just a different perspective. Mm. Yeah. One thing that I learned in your class that I thought was interesting was the destruction of Jericho, like how I had read that. Sure. You know, um, so Joshua, the city is destroyed, and it says if anybody builds this, they'll build the walls and their youngest sons and the gates and their oldest. And so I totally thought that that meant it was completely destroyed. But tell us, that wasn't wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's another perspective. <laughs> um, so in that narrative... The first thing is, when I was growing up, I always thought all the walls fell down. That's the first thing. And then when I started doing this close reading, I said, wait a minute. They didn't. It only says the wall. Mm. Okay. And because if all the walls fell down, who would have died? Rahab. Rahab, Rahab yeah. yeah. And the picture that I thought was, well, maybe her little... Her, the piece of her building stayed up when all the other walls fell down. Maybe angels came. And I said, no, it just says the wall mm -hmm. came down. So that was the first um, thing I had to start paying attention to. Like, maybe I wasn't reading the story mm -hmm. so carefully. And then if you read through the book of Joshua, it actually talks about Jericho being inhabited. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wait a minute. They're just inhabiting I, ruins or something? Right. I was yeah. like... How can it, how can Israelites live in Jericho mm -hmm. if it's been cursed? Right. So then when I kept reading, I got to 1 Kings um, 16, where it actually talks about the curse being put into effect. Mm. And within that context, it's talking about how King Ahab has been building pagan shrines and cities. Mm. Okay. And then the author says something interesting. He says, in that time... You know, so in the time where pagan shrines are being built in cities, 
then you have this gentleman come and he builds Jericho. Mm -hmm. So I started to to do intertextuality, Mm -hmm. okay, started comparing scripture with scripture, and I said, it must have been something about the way Jericho was built Mm -hmm. that was problematic. Mm -hmm. And it seems from 1 Kings 16 that the functionality of Jericho being built for pagan worship was the problem. Mm -hmm. So you have it in 1 Samuel, people living in Jericho. So obviously it wasn't just living in Jericho. It was using Jericho for a specific purpose. Mm -hmm. So that's how, you know, I start looking at these little clues and I said, oh, I was wrong all these years. (laughs) Before we end our discussion today, I want to encourage you to stay tuned for part two of our talk where we begin to apply the methods of study we discussed today to the book of Genesis in our next episode, Understanding Genesis Messianically. We're so glad you joined us this week for the first part of our discussion with Dr. Jerome Skinner on how to read the Bible. We want to thank the Adventist Learning Community for making this program possible, as well as our guest, Dr. Jerome Skinner. If you're not already following us on Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram, be sure to do so at the handle at AdventNext. Thanks so much for tuning in and see you next week.